Hey, what's going on everybody? In this video we're going to be doing a review of a Flintlock fantasy book called The Thousand Names by Django Wexler. And I think Flintlock fantasy is definitely going to be my go-to like subgenre when I do read fantasy. And when I was looking up some series or authors uh, to look into uh, in Flintlock fantasy, Django Wexler's The Shadow Campaign series uh, kept popping up. And with an author named like Django Wexler, I definitely had to check it out. And I'm really glad I did. Um, I enjoyed this first book, and it's the first book in a five-part series. And actually, the second book I'm going to be reading for the one readathon to rule them all coming up in the next couple days or so. So yeah, I'm definitely, definitely glad I read it. And so let's get started with the review. Alright, I'm just going to start a little bit with some context of the book because I found it really interesting and the setup was actually pretty unique. And that's because there is the dominant power known as the Vordran Empire, but most, well actually all of the action takes place in one of its colonial possessions known as Kandar. And Kandar is a very um, desertous and hospitable um, location, uh, country, but uh, essentially it seems that the Vordran Empire has propped up a puppet regime um, that was there before, has kept it going, but it, right before they started the book, it was essentially overthrown by a new rebellion, which is partially motivated by a new um, religious fervor and a new um, sort of cult type thing uh, going on, which is, this religion has basically tried to eradicate the old one. Anyway, so I thought that was a pretty unique setup since it is sort of a colonial occupation. Um, a lot of the forces that are sort of left to occupy this area really are more just expecting to retire more than anything else, and they're just sort of, you know, just the leftovers that are kind of forgotten most of the time, but they are the ones that actually have to, you know, go out and, you know, reinstall their puppet regime, essentially. Alright, so let's start with some of the negative things like I usually do that I had with the book, and to begin with, these colonial regiments are reinforced, obviously, since you know, they're basically undermanned and understaffed in pretty much every way since they're just sort of a occupying force that's kind of been forgotten. They're reinforced with a bunch of raw recruits from the homeland, um, but apparently they're, they are so poorly trained, it doesn't even make sense. Literally, some of them had a grand total of zero days in training. They just, like, showed up to report for duty and then got sent on a boat and sent to Kandar, and now they're expected to be, like, a functioning soldier and a functioning, uh, a bunch of them, like, into functioning, like, regiments and units and companies. It's, like, it makes really, like, no sense to me how you could literally just be, like, a random conscript levy who has been called up and expect to just, like, apparently know how to do anything. Um, I mean, even in the best case scenario, the, the line said, basically, you know, a couple of us had, like, two weeks or three weeks of training, and it just, I don't know, it just seems very, uh impractical and improbable that you could have several thousand literally just guys called up from the farms to do all this stuff. One of the other problems that I had with the book was sort of the m magical elements with the book. Um, I liked how, for the most part, they weren't like in your face all the time, I guess. Um, you know, not every chapter has like magical elements. Uh, the problem is, when they finally do show up later in the book, even though they're hinted at like a lot of through the uh, first half of the book. Once they show up, they're like very OP, I think. Um, I mean, basically, most of the magical elements of the book are supernatural beings, sort of, or they're possessed by like demons or possessed by these entities that have like powers and basically live inside them. Um, but what happens is they're so strong, they can literally like catch bullets and stuff. So to me, it was this kind of. I don't know, it just seemed like you you have like all these like regular people and then all of a sudden you have basically Superman just like hanging out. No, I mean, there's not that many of them in this book, but uh, yeah, the, it just seems like they're just way too tough for the average soldier to like deal with. So um, when we start dealing with more of them, since this is the first book, I have a feeling there's going to be more of a ramping up with the magical properties. It just seems like the average guy is just going to have, like, no chance at, like, any of this stuff. So, to me, I felt that there needed to be something sort of in the middle to give regular people a chance, or there has to be some sort of weakness to them. Um, maybe that will be in the later series, or uh, books in the series, but in this book, there really wasn't. So, it, the only way to, like, beat 
um, one of these magical entities was basically to have a stronger person that had a magical entity like living inside them and I thought that was just kind of like weird but one last thing that I didn't like about the book was there's one major relationship in the in the story and you you see it coming after like the first or second meeting between these two people and you're like okay yeah it's coming and then you find out that she basically like works for the secret police and you're like okay let's 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 not tell her all this like information you know that she's basically just like the secret police trying to find information to mess everything up and of course you know they f happen to you know have a relationship and you're just like like, th what? Like, come on. Like, just don't. Just don't. Uh, but yeah, it definitely happens. All right, now let's go to some of the good things that I really liked with the book. And probably my favorite thing about this book was probably its pacing. And that's because even though there's battles, none of them end up ever being like sort of the cataclysmic, you know, end of the world type battles. But it's at, the book is interspersed with lots of realistic sort of skirmish type battles, I guess you could say. Um, there's a few pitched battles. And then there's a few skirmishes, but all of them, you know, make sense. And, you know, there's, you know, uh, victories and losses on both sides. And it really flows really good because they're interspersed pretty evenly throughout the book, I guess you'd say. Just sort of like a real, almost like a real campaign. It's not, you know, this army marches, you know, for like weeks and months. And then at the end of the story, okay, there's like one big battle. It's actually very realistic, you know, with um, actual like, you know, strategy with the armies like trying to outmaneuver each other or you know mess with logistics and supply trains and all that sort of stuff so i felt that was actually pretty unique and since it was felt like fantasy there's a lot of um cannon and muskets and all that stuff too which i enjoy so that was pretty cool and another part of the book that i really enjoyed was that um it folk there's two major point of views and these characters were very um well done, I thought. One of them is uh, Winter Irnglass, who is a woman who's actually disguised herself as a man. And obviously that's because women can't serve in the Vordran army. And she's basically, you know, disguised herself as a man to basically escape her past. And the story follows her rise in the ranks, basically, as she performs admirably in many of her duties. And basically it's her keeping her disguise while also helping others and leading her men and all that kind of stuff. And I thought that was really well done. And the other one is a captain in the colonial regiment named Marcus Devoir. And I felt that he was written really well as well. So definitely, since I think focusing on just two major characters, um, I felt that they were really fleshed out and I had a good time reading about them. And also there's a third major character though we don't ever have his point of view. And that's the, uh, the incoming new commander of the um Bordron forces from the mainland and he's a very interesting character and even his name is just like a mouthful it's uh count colonel john is volnik mirin or something like that he was probably my favorite character he's definitely like the man with the plan he has basically all this extra knowledge that he's not like always he's really not revealing to like other people and that's why some of his decisions seem like really quirky or dangerous or rash at first but he always has reasoning to back them up and it's just interesting because he always has you know like i said like kind of knowledge and information that you know from his own sources that he's not revealing to others and he's pretty eccentric but he loves learning and that sort of thing and i think probably because of those reasons he was probably my favorite character but yeah overall i did have a really good time uh reading this flintlock fantasy and i'm definitely going to continue the series like i said i'm going to read the second one the shadow throne for the one readathon to rule them all definitely going to read that and continue the story um i hope the magic system or the whole magical elements of the series come together a little bit more um in these later books because that's basically the main thing that i'm sort of hesitant about i guess if i had to pick anything but yeah overall i definitely really enjoyed this plant love fantasy series or this one blah, 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 blah. or at least the first book in the series so far and i'm gonna give the thousand names by Django wexler Four out of five stars. And always remember, read victoriously.